good questions, I guess. <laughs> well, he has to answer them. That's right. Okay. As long as you propose a solution, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, well, my name is Rafael, and I'm a recent uh, resident of District 3 and an ex resident of District 1. And I have one question for Mr. Gloria to start off, and since we're on uh, the contributions issue, um, you said that you are being transparent about your contributions, and I want you to be transparent about the nine contributions from the high ranking officials in Manchester Navy Broadway complex that you took, and why is it that you took those? Those uh, contributions. Can you, give, can you give me the nine names? I don't know the nine names. Uh, but who, uh, who gave you the question? Uh, it was from the reading. Okay. Systems. That's okay. Oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah. Well, let me start by saying that I think my opponent reiterated my point, which is there was no explanation of how the loan will be repaid. The folks that, that you disagree with me taking money from will very likely be the same people if he's successful in, in uh, fundraising. And, you know, I, I just, I, I think you can see the point to me. The, the question that you have, I did not take uh, that money. And what my opponent has chosen to do is to suggest that I'm somehow uh, in the pocket of Doug Manchester, which is the low road and it is nothing but gutter politics. What he's trying to do is say that I'm somehow in support of Proposition 8, which is madness. In taking money from Doug Manchester bought anything, what did it buy him? Well, currently I oppose the Navy Broadway complex. Uh, I am uh, leading an effort to boycott his hotel because of his support of Proposition 8. Uh, and I am, uh, uh, I, I don't know that that got him anything, but it is incorrect. Uh, give me the names and I'll be happy to look back at it. But I think if anything, what it says is that I will take money. I have a broad base of support. I have over 1,200 individual contributors. And to the extent that I have money from developers, so does my opponent. I have money also from nonprofit executives, uh, from people in the business community, teachers. Marty, your story is repeated over and over again in my campaign. I had a gentleman come by the, the, my booth at the Adams Avenue Street Fair who gave me $3, again, because he wanted to help. Um, so I, I appreciate the question, and I'd be happy to talk to that gentleman later if he can provide the names. All right, uh, Todd brings up a few points. One is, how do I intend to repay the loan? Frankly, I don't really. Um, I am putting my own money into this race. I absolutely will not take money from people. Uh, well, what he's alluding to is the fact that if you loan your campaign money, there is a 100-day window after the election in which people can uh, continue to contribute to your campaign uh, with which to repay the loan. And so Todd is suggesting that at that point I'm going to say, okay, developers, give me you know, all your money. Uh, absolutely not. I think hopefully you know that uh, that's not what I'm going to do. Uh, I am not going to take any money from any people with any business before the city to repay that loan. Frankly, I don't expect to repay uh, any or most of that loan at all. I'm, it's my money and I'm giving it to the campaign. I have no real idea what uh, Prop 8 had to do with the discussion there. Uh, so I'll just let that one go. Um, Todd suggested I have taken developer money. Uh, the developer money that I'm aware of that I have taken, and Todd can correct me if he's familiar with others, uh, Matt Strauss, uh, Larry Cushman gave us both money, uh, Andrew Spurlock, who's a uh, landscape architect, gave me money, and uh, I've taken money from one registered lobbyist, and that is Marco Gonzalez, who's an environmental attorney. In contrast, uh, let's take a look at the bundled contributions that Todd has taken. More than $30,000 from special interests, four of the seven directors on the board of the troubled CCDC, and uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, in entirety, more than $30,000 from developers and registered lobbyists. So. Feel free to compare the two. I welcome that contrast. And you're more than welcome to go onto the city's website and look at how those numbers break down and draw any conclusions from that that you will. You know, this is really hard for me to take because I'm not used to this kind of conflict. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 
somebody else. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for sitting between us and I keeping the peace. I love it. I love it. I, I, I love it. Keep <laughs> going, guys. <laughs> we were just wondering. I've never met a national monument before in my life. Right? <laughs> Uh, two things, I won't ask a question, so we're not going to have a lot of time wasting on this. Two things, if you would, please. First, I want to ask, I'm going to say to all five of you, thank you very much. To have five major candidates come to this place and talk to us about a topic, quite honestly, you never heard of before I invited you, is a, is a monument to something, and I'm about to tell you what it is. It's a monument to your willingness to come and listen to ordinary people tell you what their interests are rather than your own interests. Thank you very much for coming. I didn't introduce myself, so I will now. I am still Jim Warren and Earl. I do still live in City Heights, which is still America's finest community. <laughs> one, of the things, one of the things I know something about is redevelopment. I'm prepared to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mel and with Ian. I'm prepared to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Marty. And anybody up there, including Mike, I'll stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Janice Weinrich, with Bill Anderson, and with the mayor. I take second to nobody on redevelopment. So I'm not going to ask you a question. I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't make a bit of difference how redevelopment is restructured by the city. Redevelopment will still occur, and there will still be occasional mismanagement. No structure will change either of those. Forget about crying this structure or that structure or the other. Now, what should you be afraid of in the restructuring of the redevelopment agency? You should be desperately frightened of the mayor's plan to establish a redevelopment czar over the whole damn thing and, ready for this, to appoint Jim Modaffer. That should frighten you. Yes, all of you who are surprised about that are advised that one of the things I have in this city is a lot of friends in low places. I sort of know what's going on. So when it comes to restructuring the redevelopment agency, don't be worried. When it comes to appointing the redevelopment czar, be terrified. Thank you very much, Mr. Mullen. Yeah. Hello, my name is David Swearings. I'm a 28-year resident of the 8th District, a citizen of the world with a very local focus. Um, I have a Mills Act question, which is much, as much legal as policy. The current Mills Act program has a progressive fee structure, $100 per 100,000 in assessed value. I understand from staff, the attorney's office has ruled this is not legal, and city staff has responded by proposing a progressive flat fee, which effectively institutionalizes discrimination based on class, consumption, income, and even race. Our, our benefit, our home from the program is about $400 or less a year. Many people get more than five thousand dollars a year. Um, a, a flat, a progressive, graduated fee structure, as adopted unanimously by council, addresses uh, the issue of parity of access to the program. Um, now, no one ever told me life was fair, and I don't expect the council to uh, propose that as a policy. But I'd like to see what you might propose to make this a little fairer, like the current program is fair. Mark, Mark, you're up. Take that one. This is complicated, and I think I would want to talk with the city attorney's office about what's legal. Uh, but uh, part of the, from what I understand from the Mills Act, part of it is providing incentives for people to come in and make an investment in an older area and to improve a property and therefore help to improve the whole area. So, uh, bottom line, I think that whatever fee structure there is needs to be affordable. And, uh, and something that doesn't discourage people, especially folks who don't have millions of dollars, uh, to be able to come in and be part of the program. So uh, I, I would seek the, the best legal advice I could to make sure that uh, what we have is fair and is legal. Let me just say this. If you call Mike Howard Reese tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., I'll tell him what you mentioned. You know what's kind of interesting? Think about this. In a sense, you have redevelopment, which means tax increment, which means that places like Grantville don't get money, you know, because of the, you know, the arrangements that they've made to move the money out, or uh, money is not available for the fundamental purposes. But then on the, and then on the other side, you have the Mills Act. So if you, if, in other words, you have a tax break in order to encourage an affirmative uh, 
maintenance of, of historic district. Like, for example, let's say Bird Rock. I think Bird Rock's a disaster. I, I hope nobody's here for Bird Rock and takes a check with that. <laughs> okay, sorry. But I, you know, I'm really sorry. I, like, I, I don't like driving by Bird Rock and looking out and not seeing the ocean. Okay, to me that's a disaster. Now, no offense intended, I'm sure you'll probably have good points on the other side. And if you run for city attorney, you can sit up here and, you know, but, but the, my, my, point being, my point being is that if you see that, you see that on the one hand we encourage historic, on the other hand we encourage redevelopment, and then the question is what are the values under, underlying all of that? And right now, you see the all out assault on the historic, and the mayor and company, you know, basically even in spite of all the things that we now see that have gone on, saying that you know we ought to keep things pretty much as they are. Now, Jim, I don't know exactly what Jim Barndor, I need to talk to you more about what you were saying, because I, I, I got a sense of it. But to me, the biggest problem I see with redevelopment is you're just giving massive amounts of money away, like in CCDC, that you don't really need anymore. You don't need to intervene in the marketplace to give people extra money when there should be market transactions that are driving that whole process, given the fact that it's such a, an affluent area, and, and there's a, there's no need to, to have market intervention, in my judgment. I would definitely ask for a legal opinion. It would be interesting to know how the sliding schedule ever was approved initially, why was that okay, and now it's not okay. And, uh, particularly because fees normally are used to cover the cost of whatever benefit comes from um, like processing the permit, whatever it costs to do that for staff should be covered with a fee. And um, the property tax increment is really the benefit that the applicant gets once they do get the Mills Act. So that, that would be based on the um, valuation of the property. It would be interesting to know how it started and why it is being changed. And Mike, will have, Mike Calabrese will have to do the opinion, I guess. Yeah, I'll support the most progressive fee structure that uh, we can under the law. I mean, I stated earlier, I mean, my interest in making sure the Mills Act is viable uh, and that it continues to invite more uh, participation. So the, the concern that you raised, I think, is valid. Um, and yeah, that's what I would say. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for being here. My question has to do with uh, upcoming community plan updates and I know that affects a lot of different areas. Bill Anderson plans to organize what he calls stakeholder groups in Uptown, for example, for review of the community plan update. Bill wants to implement a bifurcated process with a separate group of hand-picked representatives instead of simply encouraging participation of all of the members of the community as stakeholders into the update discussion. I asked him to eliminate forming a separate group so we can all talk together instead. What might, what weight, if any, would you place upon a separate stakeholders group hand-picked and organized by city staff compared to the elected community group representatives who hold public notice meetings, and if you do hold significant weight on the stakeholders group, please explain why. Thank you. When we did the community plan update in La Jolla, we were, we were lucky. Um, and we had several groups involved, and it was everyone in the community. There were um, committees formed all over the place. People worked on their special areas of interest, and it had recommendations from both the planning group and the town council. I would expect that um, I would put little or no credence in a stakeholder group. You have a recognized planning group. You have other uh, organizations that are in place in the area. They should have a history. It shouldn't be formed just for this simple path, this simple task. I would really question it. Ten bucks says that if there is a separate hand-picked group, none of us get picked. <laughs> and I think that's the point. Uh, we absolutely need to stick with the process of full public participation uh, to get the broadest array of viewpoints and the most diverse uh, uh, participation, and that's the way we need to do these community plan updates, and we need to do them more quickly than we're doing them. You know, the reason I came forward with the Neighborhood Bill of Rights is so that we would have built into the charter a mandate that the council had to be, had to provide the money to pay for the up, up, updates, because, you know, as you know, 
So much of it has been done through variance and with the developers paying for it on a project by project basis. If the stakeholder groups are doing the same thing in Barrio Logan. Uh, the whole idea, there's a whole plan to do basically away with any meaningful involvement by the community planning groups. This is what Jim Waring was about. We need to really ask the Building Industry Association to move out of the mayor's office because they can't be, that's not, not, and I'm not saying that to be smart or anything, but the Building Industry Association currently basically runs the mayor's office when it comes to the development services. I like Bill Anderson, he's a, he's a good guy, but he's basically taking orders that they don't, they, they see the community planning groups as a annoyance. I see them as a fundamental foundation of our democratic form of government in San Diego, and I think we need to be transferring more power there, not, not to play to the audience, but if you've ever been to a community planning group, mm -hmm. any group of people that are willing to meet for that long <laughs> to talk about that kind of stuff <laughs> deserves more to decide because we can unload everything on them. And, and I say that to be both funny, but, but, but because why? Because you've invested in the neighborhood. And you know, remember Ronald Reagan and decentralized uh, decision making and you know, trust the people to make the decisions. And that's what we need to do. We, we, you have to understand, I, I know what's going on because I'm there and I get to see it every day. The developers are killing and have killed San Diego and they've got to be put in a position, like all other business people, they can't make policy. One of the things I told a stakeholders group down at the Oak Time Mesa planning group, you know what they were doing there? They were having the developers act as the community planning group, and they updated the community plans, and the developers paid for all of it. Wasn't that nifty? They just circumvented the, you know, and so when I said to them, and they were all nice people, I said, look, here's the thing. If you're on this side of the table, the only thing you can think about is the community as a whole. If you're on that side of the table, you can think about your own personal interests. But if you're on this side, and you have a personal interest in this process, you've got to step over to the other side. And this is what I'm saying. The old way of doing San Diego, let's just get rid of it. We don't need it anymore. And let's not be at the margin. Let's not say how we're going to try to make a really bad situation be a tiny bit better. Let's just change it all together. We need a fundamental change. And with all of the collapsing of the, of, of the old power structure nationally and California and in San Diego, this is the time for you to step forward and be a part of this, new, this whole new power structure that we want to build that's, that's more democratic and more public interest oriented. From Chanica. Appreciate it. It's, it's a great question. And I would hope that the years that I've spent attending the Uptown Planners Committee, uh, sitting for hours, as Mike said, for many hours, you guys are doing the hard work. I, I just get to listen. Uh, is a demonstration of the fact that I value uh, the time that you spend, the input that you have. I've witnessed uh, your planning group, other planning groups take bad projects and make them into better ones. But your input is invaluable and you should have maximum input into our community plan update because we need to have those things to, ha those things to have legitimacy. They are going to be the go documents that guide our community's growth and I want you to have as much input as possible because as unfortunately we know, often these documents stay around for far, far, far too long. Uh, which is actually where I'd like to finish this. I, I think we have to come up with a better scheme of making sure that these plan updates happen on a more frequent basis. I think we all know that we've been there, that we know they need to be updated, but we're told that there's no money to do it. Uh, whether that's imposing an additional developer fee uh, so that we're collecting money every single time, so that the next time we know, like we do currently in Uptown, that our community plan no longer is reflective of our values, um, that we do have the money there to update it so that you and your neighbors can come together and craft a new vision for your neighborhood. Uh, we, cannot, we can no longer fight these projects on an ad hoc basis, and we can no longer wait until the city pulls the money together to allow us to have some uh, exercise of control over our community. Real quick. I could go on and on, but I won't because you're waiting at the mic to ask the next question. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think we've clearly said earlier okay. that we've got it backwards. DSD should be waiting for the community to come forward with what they want. DSD is trying to trickle down theory to give us what they think we want. Urban planning begins in the neighborhood. The neighborhoods know what they want. Now, I'd like to go to, and Mike made that very clear earlier, but I'd like to go to an incident that, I, and all of you have had this happen. 
I live in a Marston, George Marston track. It was one of his first ones. This happened to be 1930, that a house was built right next door to me at 1051 Myrtle Way. Today, the ground is stripped because the owner, developer, who's going to flip it when he's done, has totally wrecked what permits he had, so-called combination permit. We have two bubble skylights on the tile roof. We have, where there were no French doors, we now have six sets of French doors. And we have a trash pad, concrete trash pad, right next door to our property and right next door to the property line. Now our properties all have covenants where you can't put walls anywhere within 12 feet of the property line. But they have columns where they're going to put hedges or walls or whatever. Historic resources, when they found out what was going on, I must compliment them, they jumped on it. And I had a lot of help from people in this room telling me what to do. So they are really watching them. The trouble is, just like we said before, it happens at midnight. Every, we've got an 80 year old tree, historic, magnificus, biggest ficus that's, they've threatened to cut down. They've already cut down a 70 foot pine. We need people to say, stop it. Their penalties are greater than doing it. And that's what you're saying. All of you are saying pretty much that. And Todd, I want you to know that these gentlemen have one of your big signs that was taken into their house. I don't know that you, you, I'm sure you know who they are, but I just want you to know, watch what they're doing because I'm voting for Stephen personally because I really get concerned when I see stuff like that. I've made my mind up way before that who I was voting for, but it concerns me when I see them carry one of your big signs inside. Can I just make a suggestion that you call Diane Silver Martinez tomorrow on the code enforcement issue just to see if, if there might be something there we can do for us? I'm happy. I'm surprised you didn't ask about Balboa Park. Does no one care about Balboa yeah, Park? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the biggest disaster of all so far. So It is, because we don't well, not, you're out of the, No, you're over here. <laughs> 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 <That's laughs> <we do. laughs> My name is Judy O'Boyle, and I'm on uh, uh, the North Park Planning Committee, uh, along with Steve, and I see Tom every month as well. Uh, I think in District 3, we're really sort of lucky. We have a, a wonderful dilemma of having two good candidates from our community running. Um, I also live in Burlingame in, in a historical house that could be a standalone historical house, and the famous person that lived in my historical house was Michael Geary. And he didn't do anything to screw it up. You know, it was just fine. Um, my question uh, is, is this. I think we all know that Balboa Park is a jewel for San Diego, and it's period of historical significance really begins in 1914-15 and it goes through 1935. There's a proposal now underway that is really brought forward by former employees of General Dynamics. Uh, Ron Roberts is supporting it with money, tax money actually. Uh, and there's some support among military veterans to move uh, Atlas Missile, which is uh, Mercury missile type E into Balboa Park in the area that's in front of the um, Automotive Museum, the Aerospace Museum. And this missile is going to have a space capsule on it, but it was never designed to deliver anyone to space. It was designed to deliver weapons of mass destruction. Um, it, it, sit, it, would, it would sit over 100 feet tall. And um, there's going to be a lot of political pressure to get that placed in Balboa Park in, in an area where it's master planned to have reflective ponds and promenades and, and, and the like. So I was wondering what your position would be on that. Absolutely not. <laughs> you know, I was over in Florida Canyon the other day and I was looking back at what the Navy has done to Balboa Park. This destroyed the whole ridge 
Remember, remember uh, any of you remember when we were fighting yeah. for the expansion of the Naval Hospital? Yeah. They've destroyed it. And you know what? Elbow Park's on its way out of existence. If they put in this new private trustee group, you know, think again. They don't want to raise the money to maintain Balboa Park, so they're going to give it to a private group so they can start having privatization. You know, one of the problems that we had as soon as I got done trying to save the squirrels, which, you know, I don't care if anybody likes it or not. I grew up in Balboa Park as a little boy, and I went to all the little train there, the zoo and everything, and, and, and I thought when they went in, and, but, but in all seriousness, they, you know, they tried to get rid of all of the local parking over there by where you know, the, uh, you know, where Old Globe is, where the parking is on the side there. They wanted to privatize, that's what they want to do. See, that's their idea, that's this group. They have no sense of public. They have no sense of public education, they have no sense of public responsibility, and they're gonna privatize the park. That, that's, what you're talking about is a, is a subset of a much larger problem. If you saw the people they're trying to put on the board and, and how, what their plan is, they're going to transfer the park to a group of private people who will then control the park. And it will not, I mean, can you imagine that? And that's what they're doing, so we have to fight that. We can't allow that, and we as citizens have to be willing. If we're, if we're not willing in 2008 to keep the park, what are we willing to do in San Diego? And, and, and that's what this is going to come down to. Does everyone know what I'm even talking about? Yes. yes. Okay, is there any resistance to that at all? Are we all... Yes. Okay, not too much resistance or a little bit of... Don't be fooled by the idea that it's a painless solution with a bunch of really nice trustees who are just going to come in and just do what's right. What they're going to do is, in, in New York, uh, in New York they did this, they have private parties all throughout Central Park where you can't get access to park facilities because they're being used by private groups. That's what they're talking about. I mean, that's, I mean you know, that, that's why I say Thomas Friedman book, his book, uh, uh, hot, flat, and crowded. Just came out, talks about the breakdown of our ability to take, take on any problem at all, unwilling to make any sacrifices. We've got to change that. And Balboa Park is one of the places we've got to draw the line. But I would be, um, I, legally, I don't know if I can oppose that legally or not. I don't know if there's a legal issue there. And as you know, I don't like to get involved in policy. I just like to stay with legal. <laughs> I, I'm not being, I mean, I am being serious. I, I do have to stay within the legal, but but uh, I'm glad you told me that, and I'll have somebody take a look at that uh, from our office who looks into that whole part. You know, I want to take a second, because I think this is the most important historic preservation issue in District 3. So you, I mean, your question was about a specific project that I don't support. But more importantly, what is the next city council member for District 3 going to do for Balboa Park? Stephen or I will preside over the centennial of this park. And it's an opportunity to do something truly special. Mike was talking earlier about vision. This is a vision moment. This is a vision opportunity. We can take the centennial and we can have a cake cutting and a ribbon cutting and just call it a day and have some happy talk. Or we can do the dirty business of really going in there and making sure that we restore the park for the next 100 years. You know, a past generation of San Diegans gave us that gift. What is this generation of San Diegans going to do to renew and restore the park? 2015 is our opportunity. The time is now, and we need a council member with the knowledge and the experience to get that particular task done. I feel particularly well qualified to do that. Okay. And um, Balboa Park is such a, a great jewel right here in San Diego. We, we do need to make an investment in it, and we do need to fight for its survival. And, and that means uh, the money to restore the buildings. It means keeping it open to the public. It means a professional staff that maintains it so that it doesn't fall into disrepair again. Uh, but there are smaller versions of Balboa Park all over the city that, uh, that we, we need to honor as well. In the 7th District, uh, we have, uh, this summer, pools were closed because the city said it didn't have enough money to, uh, to uh, keep the pools open. The city, the city council approved enough money to pay the legal fees for members of the city council who got in legal trouble but, uh, but not to save money for parks and recreation centers. Uh, Mission Trails Regional Park, 7,500 acres of open space. It's a, that's a great jewel in our presence. And, uh, and each community, I, I think, does need to stand up and say, enough. 
We're not going to give these things away. We're not going to continue to squander. We are going to make those long-term investments that we need to make and uh, set our priorities and, and be real clear about them. So Balboa Park, absolutely. We've got to, we've got to maintain the integrity and somehow an Atlas missile in the middle of the park because it seemed <laughs> to communicate what it's supposed to be about. As far as Atlas Centaur missiles, I'm rather fond of them. They put me through school. <laughs> um, but I remember it being in Missile Park, and I don't know why I can't stay in Missile Park. That's where they were designed and built. They should, it doesn't belong in Double Park. Any answer there. to your question? <laughs> um, I have recently realized that uh, downtown has gone through very much uh, redevelopment, and it looks amazing and a lot of new citizens and uh, more tourist attractions and whatnot. But the bad side of that is that about 1,500 homeless people in San Diego have been pushed out. And I've s talked to them and seen their side of the story. And I've also realized that the city has enacted some ordinances limiting people to stay in parks only 30 minutes, or young kids that are maybe like 15 or 16 and don't have anywhere to go and only hang out at the parks, where do you expect them to go? Um, where do you expect them to go once uh, night falls? And they, where there is uh, now a high rise and that used to be their squat, where do you expect them to sleep? So how are you as a city council or a city attorney going to address both sides of the development, the good side of the development of uh, downtown and the bad side? or the, the troubled side? Well, I don't see this as necessarily a, an issue of development. Uh, uh, you know, we, we've created a minimum wage economy in San Diego, where two-thirds of the jobs created in the last 10 years are minimum wage jobs that don't offer health benefits. Uh, we've undermined working families uh, who are trying to maintain homes, carry a mortgage, uh, and, and as a community, I, I think we have to do a better job of creating middle-class jobs, green-collar jobs, technology jobs, life science jobs, and government needs to help bring in those investments and make that happen. I think we also need to hold the county's feet to the fire. The county uh, has, uh, has the authority over uh, mental health care. They've got money, and I don't think that they're spending it the way they need to be spending it here in San Diego. The vast majority of homeless people in San Diego are profoundly mentally ill. Uh, they, and they, and they uh, numb themselves with, sometimes with, with booze and other drugs. And we, we need solid intervention to help these people out. And that means more than just a winter shelter. We need, we need a year-round facility, one-stop shopping for people who really do want to get off the street, who have the capability, and, uh, and then can work a program get medications they need that work so well these days, and, and really help them find a path to self-sufficiency. Uh, and uh, for too long, the city of San Diego, I think, has been straddled with many of these expenses. We've got the bulk of the problem. The county turns its back. We need to start holding them accountable. The same is true with fire protection. You know, for 10 years now, the county of San Diego has been receiving money from Proposition 172 in excess of $200 million a year that was supposed to be earmarked for fire safety. Where are the fire stations? Where is the equipment in the, in the unincorporated areas that could have stopped these wildfires from coming into San Diego over the course of the last five, six years? Uh, I think this, the city of San Diego needs to get tough and demand more from its partner, the county. And, uh, and then get that, that year-round shelter open. Let's provide real uh, holistic care to these folks and help them create a life uh, where they don't have to be in somebody's doorway. That's my question. I'm not going to add much to that, but I would like to say that the homeless problem is not just downtown. And while we do need a year-round shelter, maybe we don't need just one. We need to have shelters where the people are, where the services are. And yes, we have to go after the county and get help with taking care of this. 
And I would only add that in addition to uh, year-round shelter and ensuring the county uh, lives up to its end of the bargain, we also need to demand that our federal government uh, provide the proper care for our returning combat troops. So many of the folks who are homeless in our communities are military veterans who haven't received the kind of care that they need. We need to be compassionate toward them, uh, not only now, but when they're returning from combat. You know, the way things are going, there's going to be a lot more homeless people. Yeah. It's not just going to be, you know, the sort of marginal people. One of the reasons we tried to stop condo conversions in the way that, you know, to require proper planning is because the condo conversions push tons and tons of people out of their houses, and then those condos are now sitting empty. It, it, you know, th another example, remember I said before, you can't have the housing industry or the condo industry driving all the policy. There has to be a, a public involvement in that process as well. You know, one of the decisions I'm the proudest of the city attorney, is probably one of the decisions that's the most controversial, which is I wrote a legal opinion saying the police couldn't put the homeless in jail uh, because for the mere fact that they're homeless since we didn't have a sufficient uh, shelters. We, we can do better. Uh, you know, they say the provision, Samuel Johnson said the provision for the homeless, or the provision for the poor is, is in many ways the most important test of your, of your community. Portland is doing better, San Francisco is doing better. I'm not suggesting we'd be a mecca for the homeless, but we can do better than what we're doing now. And, you know, we have uh, a situation where we, we don't really take that issue seriously because the homeless don't have, they don't have political power. But, but they are enormously intrusive. Uh, they're sleeping, you know, all throughout uh, public areas. I don't know about the 30 minute rule. I, I'm not familiar with that. I'll check into that tomorrow as well. Uh, but the, what the idea is, is that we, we need to do a better job of dealing with the problem of homelessness at the city council level. And it's a hard problem, but what we're basically doing now is it's a, so it's, it's really the, the, uh, the, the fallback position the, of just letting them sleep wherever they can at night. And that's not a very good you know, resolution because it takes a real toll on the local and the businesses downtown. And, and it isn't just downtown only, but downtown, I think, I think fairly would be the, the area that has the most impact. I would just add, um, I appreciate the question because it doesn't come up nearly as often as it should, although this is an issue that uh, does profoundly impact our neighborhoods, particularly in District 3. Um, being adjacent to downtown, uh, our canyons have really become our de facto affordable housing in this community, and that's a shame. Uh, I've always been disturbed that our city seems to only care about homeless people for about 16 weeks during the wintertime, and that's not sufficient. Um, that is not reflective of America's finest city. Uh, we do need a year-round homeless shelter. And let me just give you a small snapshot of how impactful this can be. Uh, I volunteer every year so at Stand Down for Homeless Veterans okay. right here in San Diego High School. Uh, each year, we get roughly 800 veterans who show up. Uh, over those three days, we were able to place 73, 74 in permanent housing. If that one day, a three-day effort can take care of 10% of that particular uh, population, what could we do with concerted year-round effort? Uh, we need to do more. Uh, this is something I particularly would like to lead on if I was on the city council. Okay. Um, we are getting a little close to the end here. We'll have time for about, I think, two more questions. Um, I don't want everybody to...